Good morning. Before I begin, I wanted to uh, let you all know uh, my uncle has uh, the COVID virus and he's in the hospital on the west side of Indianapolis in intensive care and uh, when uh, they can test him and he, and he doesn't have the virus anymore, they're going to put him in hospice in the hospital because we don't think he's going to make it. He's in his 80s. He's lived a long, good life. When, and when my grandfather passed away and I was starting high school, I moved in with my aunt and uncle because they farmed our property and their farm as well. And we worked together all the time. And my aunt and uncle were Christians at the Brownsburg Church in Indiana. And uh, so it was natural for me and my two sisters to move in with them. And so he is the dad I had in my teenage <laughs> years, which can be difficult years, you know. Of course, they had it easy with me. <laughs> but my uncle was a great example. He uh, and my aunt were very uh, hospitable. There were many Sundays when they would have groups of Christians at their house for lunch with a thousand kids running around. My uncle uh, was a great example of sharing the gospel with others. I don't know anyone at Brownsburg that had converted more people than he had. I don't, except maybe Harold Comer, the preacher, for years. Some of you might know Harold Comer. And my uncle was always uh, going to visit people, uh, going to visit people who weren't Christians to try to reach them with the gospel. He was uh, the... Uh, they didn't have a union for bus drivers, but he ran the union, the organization that they had. And he was the one who counseled everybody with problems, everybody. And he did that for decades. They loved him so much. So, there you go. Think of him in your prayers. He doesn't want to eat anymore. And they don't have the feeding tube in him. Do you need a makeover? Your house? Your career? Your body? <laughs> I like to have a makeover with my body. How about you, Kevin? <laughs> or your looks? I won't point anybody out on that one, okay? I love this Sharpay picture, don't you? I look at that and I feel pretty good about myself. <laughs> Today we're going to look at God's makeover of you and me. How God has made it possible for people to live new life in Christ. We're going to talk about living that new life in Christ. We're not saying living the high life now. We're not saying living the pop popular life. We're not saying living the rich or the famous life living the beautiful people life, those things are all temporary <laughs> and fading. Every one of them is fading. Christians are living the life 
of godliness. Paul told Timothy to exercise himself unto godliness in 1 Timothy 4. He said, godliness holds the promise of the present life and also of the life to come. Godliness is being devoted to serving God. That's what godliness is. Eusebia, the Greek word. Devoted to serving God is what God, godliness is. And is what our life should be, right? Ecclesiastes 12, 13, 14. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man, right? It's a life lived where you're storing up for the future, Paul told the rich folks through Tim Timothy in chapter 6 of First Timothy. I got the wrong letter up there. Jesus said in John 10 when he talked about himself being the good shepherd who would give his life for a sheep, he said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The new life in Christ is the abundant life. You know, last Sunday I talked about on the Lord's Supper message, learning Christ, and we learn from Christ even at Calvary, don't we? We looked at Ephesians chapter 4, and this morning I'm going to go back to that text. You remember Paul said that we need to quit living like the Gentiles live, who, who are excluded from fellowship with God, life, the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart, and and Paul talked about the progression of sin in people's lives and, and, and their pursuit of sin in their lives. But he says, but you did not learn Christ in this way. And we talked about learning Christ last week. And we want to con continue talking about it. Because as, as, as I was studying for this last week, I thought, you know what? I'd like to go preach it on the rest of this chapter. And by the way, it goes into chapter 5 as well. And by the way, it goes into chapter 6 as well. Learning Christ. For example, in chapter 5, he says, Husbands, love your wives as who? As Christ loved the church. So there you go. It goes on in to the rest of this letter. Okay? He says, But you did not learn Christ in this way. He, Christ did not live in ungodliness. He lived in righteousness and holiness and peace. He says, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him just as truth is in Jesus, Christians are to be disciples, followers of Christ. And we were created in Christ for good works, Paul says in Ephesians 2 verse 10. That's our purpose. That's our design through the gospel to walk in good works. And in Jesus, doctrinal and moral truth is found. And when we go through this text, we're going to see that moral truth in this particular text of Scripture. Paul said that in reference to your former manner of life, that you lay aside the old self. It's interesting when you look at the Greek verbs in this text. The, the, word, the words lay aside the old self is second aorist middle infinitive. What that means is that there was a point a point in time when you laid aside the old self and that continues on now in your life as a Christian, okay? It doesn't mean that you don't struggle with the old self from time to time. It doesn't mean that you're battling against those stupid things that you used to do. Sorry about using the S word, moms and dads. <laughs> That's the old man speaking. Lay aside the old self. You, you began when you obeyed the gospel, when you were buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life, Romans chapter 6 verse 4 says. You laid aside the old self. You died to yourself. You crucified the old man, Paul says in Galatians. You crucified the old man with Christ. You buried him and you rose to walk in newness of life. And so, even so, so consider yourselves to be dead to sin, Paul said in Romans 6, 11, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And that's the new life, alive to God, being devoted to serving God, godliness. Okay? Years ago, years ago, uh, I was blessed to be in a congregation in Tampa 
that had uh, an elderly preacher that they brought in to, 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 to keep him busy. He needed to be kept busy. And he was, a, he was an amazing preacher. His name was James P. Miller. Anybody know James P. Miller? Probably nobody does, because he was a 40s and 50s preacher. <laughs> okay? Preached in Philadelphia, known for doing that. He held all kinds of debates through the years. But uh, he, was, he, he, he presented uh, a preacher training classes there, and I, and I was in those. Uh, and uh, he got up one day and he said, Now, young men, don't be preaching any expository lessons, he said. <laughs> he said, You'll bore the brethren to death. That's what he said. <laughs> well, I disagree with him. I think expository sermons are some of the best that there are. But they do require more studying. <laughs> It's easy to make up a topical lesson like that. But they require more research and investigation and thinking. It requires a lot of time. And probably when I was a young preacher, I bored some people with some expository lesson. But it sure helped me. And we're looking at this text in an expository manner as we go through here. He says, and put on the new self. The new self. No, the word, the verbs put on, put on, is also this aorist middle, that, that you did this when you obeyed the gospel, and it continues on. So you did this in the past when you obeyed the gospel, but you're continuing to grow as a Christian and putting on the new, new person daily. You know, people are always looking for a new you. Makeover, right? Got to cut your hair a different way. You know. I don't do that anymore. <laughs> well, God wants a new you, and the objective is to learn Christ, to be more like Christ, to be conformed to the image of His Son, Romans 8, verse 29 says. And in this text, we're going to see the great change that is to take place in the life of a Christian from the, cat, from the caterpillar to the butterfly, the new you. In this text, though, as we go on, I want you to be on the lookout. I want you to be on the lookout for, so, for solutions to problems going on in our country. As... I was thinking about what to say today. I thought, you know, I, I got to say something about all the turmoil that's going on in the world today. We need to hear things that maybe could help somewhat in our personal lives and certainly that could help in the world. But as we go through this text, look for solutions to problems going on in our country. Our Solutions to problems that you might be having with people in your life. Think about that as we go through this text. And so here's the new life. The old man put on, off and the new man put on. He says, therefore, notice the word therefore. All those verses we just looked at are coming to this point. Paul says, I want you to learn Christ. Therefore, here's learning Christ. Laying aside falsehood. The new you be a truth teller. <laughs> Speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And so we're not to be liars. We're, we're not deceivers. Not to be fake or cheaters. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 8, we learn that some of the Christians were defrauding one another. They were cheating one another and having to go to court even to get things solved. And Paul says, you brethren should be able to solve those problems on your own. Remember that in 1 Corinthians 6? 
I've known Christians who lied. <laughs> and sometimes I've lied when I shouldn't have. And he says here that you speak truth, each one of you, with your neighbor. Well, who's your neighbor, huh? Who is your neighbor? Well, that was a big question presented to Jesus, wasn't it? In Luke chapter 10, when he told the story of the Good Samaritan. And what did we learn there about who is our neighbor? Anybody who we, that we meet that needs our help, our encouragement. Anybody that we meet is my neighbor. And notice the importance of speaking the truth in order to have unity. Speak truth in each one of you with your neighbor, for we are members of one another. When this leg says we're going that way, it informs this leg of it too. <laughs> and doesn't go that way in telling this leg, no, we're going to go that way. That causes confusion. And I can't do the splits. Notice the importance of speaking truth to unity, cohesiveness, getting along with one another, speaking the truth. That's true in marriages, isn't it? That's true in being a teenager. Your mom and dad expect you to be truthful with them always. And when you're not, then, then you lose trust. You lose cohesiveness. You, lo you lose getting along with one another. Truth-telling is so important to unity, even in the family of God. But of course, you know, in Ephesians 4, verse 15, Paul tells us that we need to speak the truth in love. <laughs> that means I'm really committed to you when I tell you the truth. I'm really, I'm, re I'm really on your side helping out. That's me. We need to speak truth if we're going to go to heaven. Anybody ever listen to BC, BB and CC Winans? <laughs> yeah. I, I love some of their music. And uh, they got that song, uh, I'll Take You There. You heard that song? I'll take you there. I'm sorry. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the statements in, is, in heaven, there ain't no smiling faces lying to the races. One of the lines in that song. I want to tell you, there's been a lot of lying to the races in this world. All over the world. People being taken advantage of and being mistreated. But in heaven, as the book of Revelation says, there ain't going to be no liars. <laughs> Sorry about the bad English, but it's for emphasis sake. Okay? Then he says, be angry. A.T. Robertson was one of the greatest Greek scholars and in at the at early 1900s, late 1800s, in Louisville, Kentucky, he has a has a Greek grammar that's about six inches thick. <laughs> so talk about a Greek scholar he was. He says that this is the, a permissive imperative. It's like this: Okay, go ahead and be angry. <laughs> permissive, be angry. What, the, what I like about that is that this tells us that you're going to get angry. Is there anybody in this audience that's never gotten upset at anything? <laughs> Are angry with it? Angry is, it, the word anger is, it, it describes the, the heat going on inside, getting upset inside. That's the, the anger inside of us that boils up, you know, that's steaming up. Sometimes we suppress it, sometimes we don't. And the expression of it is wrath. 
That's the, that's the physical and verbal expression of the anger, is wrath. He says, be angry. I'm glad God understands that I get angry. Sometimes Jesus was angry, wasn't he? He was angry when people were mistreating or, or lying to other folks. He was angry. He was angry when he turned those tables over in the temple, wasn't he? Because they were taking advantage of people and turned, turned the temple into a place of business to take advantage of folks. Sometimes we need to get angry about certain things, but he says, be angry and yet do not sin. When was the last time you got angry? On the way to church? <laughs> Anybody ever been angry on the way to church? Mom and dad, huh? Kids fighting in the back seat. When would you quit that? <laughs> yeah. You ever get angry driving down Interstate 77 or 85? Huh? Yeah, we do. Yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. That means we need to get rid of it in destructive ways, don't we? I'll tell you something that will help you get rid of it when you're driving down 77 is just start praying. <laughs> just start praying. But what do we do? We hide ourselves from those that we're angry with. We slam the door, get in our F-150 and go speeding down the road, Right? We give them the flaming looks, the harmful words, the inconsiderate actions. You don't deserve my kindness today when we get angry at others. But he says, do not get angry. Do not give the devil an opportunity. And those words, do not, are imperative there's a lot of Greek imperatives used in this verse. An imperative is a sentence where you, where you say, Hey, you! Hey, you! And the you is understood. It's like, you know, when your kids are doing something and, and you, you don't have to say their names, do, do you? You don't have to. You just say, quit it! Right? <laughs> quit it! And what does that mean? It means you quit it. All of you quit it. That's what that means. And in this text, God tells us, do not. Okay, how are you going to treat that? That's pretty serious. <laughs> yeah. Don't give the devil an opportunity. The devil, diabolos is a Greek word, is the biggest user and he's the biggest loser. And we let him grab us by the tail and just direct our lives when it comes to anger sometimes. Yes, I had coffee this morning. <laughs> he who steals must steal no longer. Uh, the Greek is, is interesting. The Greek says, the one stealing, stop stealing. There's that imperative again. Stop it. <laughs> you klepto. <laughs> And that's the Greek word for stealing in this text. Is there justification for stealing? We saw stealing on TV. I, in Minneapolis, I couldn't believe these people coming out of the uh, liquor store with boxes of liquor. I couldn't believe these people coming out of Target with 52-inch TVs. Can you believe that? And I hope none of them were Christians. Or if they were, they sure need to repent. Because God says, stop stealing. Now, someone might say, well, hey, the world has deprived me of this. I deserve the right to steal. You know what? In the first century, in the first century, A.D., There, were no, there was no social security. There were destitute widows everywhere. 
There were orphan children everywhere. There was no social program. There was no assistance. There were no food banks. There was no goodwill to go down and buy from. It did not exist. And this text tells these Christians, don't steal. Did you know that during the Great Depression, crime did not increase in this country? Did you know that? If we have another Great Depression, do you think crime will increase in this country today? Yes, because this country does not have the moral background, backbone, I should say, that it once had. That'll be the problem. What would Jesus do? Well, he'd just make fish and bread, right? <laughs> yeah, he would. He certainly wouldn't steal it. He says, that, he, he says in this text that we need uh, to, to rather labor. He must labor. Notice, must labor. Subjunctive mood here. <laughs> He must labor. Labor's a good thing. I like laboring. I like digging in the dirt. I like hammering nails. I like, I like doing that stuff. And I think I've pretty much worn my body out doing all those, all those kind of things all these years. But, but hey, I like it. If my wife wants to find me. She finds me out digging in the dirt in the garden. <laughs> and... In this country, in the early 1900s, they had what they used to call the Protestant work ethic. That's what they called it. And that's what made America great, was the Protestant work ethic. And I will tell you, we don't have as much of that ethic as we once had in the country. But why do you work? Performing with his own hands what is good, work is good so that he will have something to share with one who has need. And so we don't work because of greed. We work because of need. Whether it's in our family or whether it's in my neighborhood or whether it's in my country. I'm glad that I pay Social Security. You may not like it. I didn't like writing that $4,000 bill back when I only made $24,000 a year. I didn't like that. Not at all. But there was only one good thing about it is that I knew that it would help a widow out somewhere. Share. Notice the mind and attitude change. The Greek word share means to give with. When you give, you are giving your person into this experience of sharing with others. And you make the fulfillment of that need personal. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Would you quit saying that garbage? <laughs> the word unwholesome here is the is, is Greek word for garbage. Rotten words. Years ago, I went with, some, with my wife and family, <coughs> my cousins, we went to a Japanese restaurant. You know those Japanese restaurants where they cook out right there in front of you? This, and that's the first time I'd been there, and I was just intrigued by the whole experience. And he was chop, chop, chopping and, and throwing food everywhere, and he had all kinds of things there, and, 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 he, and he was filling people's plates, and he was chop, chop, chopping and, and, and had all this butter on that grill, and, 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 and he was scraping up and cleaning the grill. And I said, what are you going to do with that? I want to eat that. That's what I told him. And he said, you eat garbage? <laughs> to me, that, that, that grilled stuff is the best stuff there is with some butter in it. Man. But we don't want garbage coming out of our mouth. You know what your mom would say? If you don't have something, not something nice to say, don't say anything at all. Right? We need to have speech that edifies. 
only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. So our speech needs to edify, that is build up, inform, encourage. Years ago in Floyd Knobs, Indiana, which is the little mountains above the Ohio River across from Louisville, Kentucky, okay, uh, I drove a school bus there and I preached. I drove a school bus at Floyd Knobs High School. And one of the bus drivers was Carl Kiesler. And when all the bus drivers got there early, you know, they all flocked to Carl Kiesler's bus because everybody loved him. He always had a smile. He always had good counsel. He was always an encourager. He just always that way. And, and, and people just like were like moths to, the, to a light bulb, you know, flying to him because Carl Kiesler was going to lift their spirits that day. They just knew he would. D. Bowman's that way too. You ever know, anybody know D. Bowman, the preacher in Texas? He's that way too. Man, I need to be more like that. How about you? Do you have grace-giving speech? Let your speech always be with grace. As though seasoned with salt. That just makes my saliva start to run right there. So that you will know how you should spend, respond to each person. You need to think about how you respond to people. To your wife, to your kids, to your neighbor, to those you work with. Think about how you respond. And let your speech be oiled, be salted with, with grace. I was going to say gravy, but I meant grace. <laughs> Unmerited favor. They, they don't deserve that speech, you say? They don't deserve it? Do you deserve God's grace? Let your speech be with grace. Always with grace. And, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of, of redemption. Does it matter if my speech is gracious? Does, does it matter if I labor with my hands the things that, that is good and share with others? Does it matter? That I put down my anger? Does it matter? Well, rotten speech grieves the Holy Spirit. We were sealed with the Holy Spirit when we obeyed the gospel. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14, we were sealed. That means there's some kind of relationship between us and the Holy Spirit that, that was begun when I became a Christian and will continue to the day when I'm I'm raised from the dead to go to heaven. And you don't want to mess up that relationship you have with the Holy Spirit. And when you don't have speech with grace, you're causing the Holy Spirit to sorrow. Doesn't this, isn't this a beautiful text to show us the personhood of the Holy Spirit? and the personality of the Holy Spirit, God. That the Spirit is caused to sorrow when we say honorary things to our spouse. The Holy Spirit is caused to sorrow. That should cause us to stop and think about our new life about lying, about rotten speech. He says this, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. He just, he just throws it all in the bucket, don't he? Right there in that text. <laughs> bitterness is a state of mind where people or things irritate us, cause us to dislike them, and makes us sour and crabby and and have repulsive feelings towards folks. I've seen Christians in churches that way towards each other. Bitterness. You've got to let go of it. You've got to let go of it. It's like, 
It's like you, you're thrown in, in, in the ocean with a great big old rock in your hands and you just want that rock so badly because it's gold. It's gold. I got to have that. Got to have this. Got to have my bitterness towards you because of what you did. And you won't let go of it and you're going to drown to death spiritually. Let go of it. And the wrath. Again, wrath is the anger expressed, hitting, throwing, yelling, co- cussing out somebody. Anger is those boiling up inside. Clamor is verbal yelling. You ever see two people argue and they, and they compete with one another and getting louder and louder? Maybe you've been there. <laughs> Maybe you've been there. I've had those kind of challenges sometimes on the school bus, <laughs> I'm ashamed to say. But sometimes I've done it on purpose for the, for the effect. It's sad when you realize that some of the kids that you drive on the school bus will never stop unless someone totally yells at them because that's all they're used to. I had this little boy in Sarasota on the bus, special needs bus, little bitty fella, lived in the projects, lived in a drug-infested house, apartment. Literally, uh, I mean, I had to go to the door one day and found two of them on the floor. I had to call the social worker in. But this little kid was uh, autistic, extremely autistic. And he would come on the bus and he'd sit down with his uh, backpack with tractors all over it. I loved it. And he would sit down and he wouldn't say a thing. And you'd be driving down the road and all of a sudden he'd, He'd yell and scream out some of the ugliest things that you'd ever hear. That's all he would say. He would just say a a sentence of ugly things. You know why he did that? Because that's all the garbage he ever heard. That's why. Just for fun, let me tell you. I had Jesse on the bus. He was he was autistic too, and Jesse, Jesse. Uh, would make a lot of noise, on the other hand. And I would say, Jesse, be quiet. And I'd be driving down the road, and everything would be quiet. And the, that little boy, that little boy that I just spoke of, he would, he would yell out, Jesse, be quiet. <laughs> I loved it. Verbal yelling, get rid of it. Slander, verbally cutting down someone, cussing someone out. Malice is badness, meanness, honry, mean-spirited. Let all these things be put away from you. And be what? Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Notice that when you put off, you leave a vacuum, right? And if you don't fill that vacuum, it's going to come back on you. It's going to come back to haunt you. So you've got to fill it with something good, right? That's right. Years ago, we lived close to Chicago. And I love going to Chicago. It's an interesting city. And uh, we were going to some of the museums up there, and we went in the wintertime. We'd had 21 inches of snow one Saturday night. 21 inches of snow in one night. And it, that snow caused havoc in Chicago. But some, sometime after that, we went to Chicago to the museums, and we came out, and we accidentally got off the Interstate 94 onto some, some neighborhood area. And, I, and it was horrible. I was in my 1969 Chevrolet Impala and driving on on these little side streets between houses and the road was complete ice with deep ruts. And you could not stay out of the ruts. (laughs) You'd be caught in it and then you were stuck in the rut. You were stuck in it. Sometimes we get in these deep ruts that we've cut in our lives by the way we've lived, that it's hard for us to get out of them, to put on the new man that we need to be putting on. And that's why we need other Christians to help us. 
That's why we need God in prayer to help us and be committed to putting on the new man. Be kind. Notice the imperative here again. Be kind. It's not a suggestion. <laughs> and kindness is being gentle, easy with people, not harsh, not mean. Kindness shows itself in actions that are good and pleasant and gracious and useful to others. And be forgiving. And tenderhearted. I like the Greek word tenderhearted. I've always liked this Greek word. Can you read that word? E-U-S-T-L-A-N. It's got 12 letters. <laughs> it's a big old long word. The E-U means good. That's what it means. And what it means is it means to be good bowed. I'm good bowed. Yeah. The King James Bible in Colossians 3.12 translates it, bowels of mercies. What in the world that, what does that mean? It means to be moved with feeling in your gut. You ever, hear, you ever say, I've got a gut feeling about this? Well, when we see people in need, we need to have gut feeling. Feelings of compassion, yearning. Yearning with compassion. Often, this word is used of Jesus. Look at all those verses. Do you see all those verses? Matthew and Mark, look at all those verses where Jesus had compassion on people who were suffering, on people who were needing, on people who needed someone to be moved with action to do something to help them out. That was Jesus. And so I ask the question, how's your gut today? Do you need a probiotic? This is your probiotic right here. And the picture of the new man that's in here. That's your probiotic. That's going to help your gut to be what it ought to be. I love this word. I love it. And be forgiving. When you forgive, what you do is you give grace to people. You extend grace to people, don't you? And you know, you know people around you have issues. <laughs> My wife has issues. I have issues. I wrote this up here. I said, people around us have issues. Take your kids and grandkids, for, in for instance. Aren't you always having to correct little kids? Huh? Don't be hitting. Be nice. <laughs> Quit that. <laughs> We're always having to correct those around us, aren't we? They have issues, and we need to forgive. It, it is easy, or is it easy for you to forgive? It needs to be as a Christian, because we need to just stop and think about how often we ask God to forgive us. Did you do that this morning? I did. And what happens when we forgive? Our relationships are improved, aren't they? And when we forgive, we're looking at life from an eternal perspective. Forgive each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. God looks at us with a view of forgiving. He gives us grace. Okay. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us and an offering and sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. And so when we go through this text, you see that we got another therefore thrown into the text. He's kind of making a summation of all the things he said in the previous verses in this verse because you can sum it all up in the word love, right? Because love doesn't blow up with anger, does it? Love doesn't say unwholesome words, does it? Love is kind, right? Yeah. And so we are to love as Jesus and the Father have loved us. And we are to walk. Notice the word walk. 
I talked about that word from Ephesians 4 verse 1 and, and there are many verses in Ephesians where Paul uses this word walk describing the lifestyle of a Christian. It is your calling to walk in love. It is your vocation to walk in love. That idea is taken from verse 1 of chapter 4. Unselfish, self-sacrificing love. Committed to caring for the other individual. God calls us to walk in love. He calls us to give our lives as a living sacrifice. Jesus is spoken of as a sacrifice in this verse. But you know, we're, we're told to sacrifice ourselves too. Be, and we sacrifice ourselves in giving ourselves to God, to living the new life that He wants us to live. And by the way, by the way, James chapter 2, Love is not prejudicial. It doesn't show prejudice. Love doesn't do that. Remember in that text where James says, when you prejudge somebody and treat them bad because of their clothes, because of their economic status, because of the color of their skin, because of what side of the tracks they live on, because they live, they live way out in the boonies or boondocks. <laughs> when you, if you show that kind of prejudice, you're not loving them. You're not fulfilling, James says, the royal law to love your neighbor as yourself, he says. Walk in love as Christ also loved you. So, in this text, we're on the lookout for solutions going on with the problems in our country. Yeah, the text is full of ideas to help us, isn't it? For solutions to problems that we might be having with people in our lives. Are love and kindness and compassion and forgiveness the solutions? Yes, they are. That's the lesson. Thank you for your time and patience with me. Remember, you are to be living the new life. Remember who you are. You're a child of God. You're an imitator of Jesus Christ. You're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. You're a holy one, different one, aren't you? And so as we close this lesson, if you're here and you're not a Christian, are you ready for new life in Christ? Wasn't that a beautiful life you just saw in Ephesians 4? Do you want that kind of life? Then you can obey the gospel today. Are you ready to be baptized and have your sins washed away? Acts 22, 16 says, And now what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Of course, calling on Him to save you. If we can help you obey the gospel this morning, come while we stand and sing.